Today we have a great malicious compliance story all about high-ranking officers who want to reserve a table. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, but I wanted a silver laptop. First time posting here, so apologies for any mistakes. This story dates back to about 9 years ago when I, 31 year old male at the time this took place, worked as an IT lead technician for a very large multinational company. It's a bit long, so sorry about that. The company had a range of different laptops available for employees to choose from that were classified by their size and weight. This is important later, including standard laptops, i.e. a typical laptop with a 14 inch screen, as well as lightweight laptops, smaller, thinner and with a 12.5 inch screen, and if you're a frequent traveler, most of these laptops were pretty boring, grey business devices, nothing special to look at. Anyway, one day, the computer manufacturer introduced a new lightweight laptop model that was silver in color and far more sleek and good looking than the previous grey model. We deployed a few of these around the building and soon got a visit from a lady who'd seen one of her colleagues with a shiny new silver laptop and had developed a severe case of shiny device envy. I'll call her shiny employee for the purpose of this story. Shiny employee said, how do I go about getting one of those smaller laptops? I say your current standard laptop isn't due to be replaced yet, but you can request a change to a lightweight laptop on the IT website. Your manager will need to approve it however. Now, to be honest, I wasn't a particular fan of people who waste the company's money simply by wanting the latest shiny gadget, especially because it creates additional work for my team and involves replacing equipment that is still perfectly functional and within warranty, but I behaved in a professional manner and simply towed the company line. Shiny employee walked away and the next day an approved request came through for a lightweight laptop. Fair enough. What she didn't know was that the company policy dictated that we only provided a brand new laptop if we didn't have usable secondhand laptops in stock, i.e. those handed back to IT from people who'd left the company. Being the good IT tech that I am, I scoured our return shelf and sure enough, there was a used lightweight laptop in stock. Unfortunately for this lady, it was last year's grey model. But rules are rules, so I asked one of my team to prep it for her. She's then told that it's ready and comes along to pick it up. She takes one look at it and promptly throws a tantrum. This isn't the one I wanted, I wanted the silver one. I said sorry, company policy is that we can only order a new laptop if we don't have a usable secondhand one in stock. She says, but this isn't the one I ordered. I say yes it is, you ordered a lightweight laptop, and this is exactly what we've set up for you. I turn the laptop over and show her the company's sticker, confirming it to be the same classification of lightweight laptop as her request, and show her that it is physically smaller and lighter than her existing laptop. She says, no, I wanted a new silver one. This is unacceptable. I'm going to complain to your boss. She stormed off in a huff and I could soon hear her complaining inside my boss's office. Unfortunately, although my boss knew I was just following process, he couldn't handle all of the repeated moaning and soon folded and asked me to order a new device for her. I wasn't at all pleased at being overruled when I was simply applying company policy, particularly when it's just a waste of money for a shiny employee that wants the latest silver gadget. So, cue malicious compliance time. I could have just scoured our shelf of brand new laptops and dug out a new one for her. We installed dozens of laptops a week. It was a big company, so we always had plenty of new ones in stock. But I was told to order a new one. So that's the process I'd follow. I say, okay, we can order a brand new silver one for you, but you'll need to raise another request ticket so we can order the laptop from it. I said this knowing full well that this ticket would go to shiny employee's manager once again for approval, a manager who has a finite department budget. Sure enough, an hour later I get a phone call from shiny employee's manager. Why is shiny employee ordering yet another laptop? I reply, she didn't like the color of the laptop we'd prepared for her. It was grey and she wanted a silver one. They said, how much is this going to cost me? I said, well, you'll still be paying the monthly lease costs on shiny employee's original laptop as it wasn't due for replacement plus the lease cost of the lightweight laptop we prepared for her earlier and there'll also be the lease cost for this new laptop as well. They said, oh heck no, I'm not paying for all of that. I'll reject this ticket and I'll have a word with her. 
A short while later, shiny employee returns. She's rather humble and quiet now after being chastised by her boss for trying to waste all his budget in the pursuit of having the latest shiny silver gadget. She quietly accepts the grey lightweight laptop we'd prepared earlier for her and then quickly departs. I spend the rest of the day with a grin on my face. I mean, I guess it just comes with the territory of being an IT technician, but I would hate having to put up with these kinds of people that, like, aren't really even going to make any utilization with, like, newer, fancier, or faster tech. They just want it because it's shiny and they don't want to look a generation or two behind. Like, how about just focus on what gets your work done? Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is, want us to strictly follow company policies? No problem. This malicious compliance comes from a few years ago when I was working as an external developer for a software house. The team was great and the lead developer, let's call him Mark, was simply the best to work with. He was a very skilled developer with also the ability to easily coordinate the team's tasks. We also had a manager, John, who was also very friendly and easy to talk to. Our job was going smoothly. The company tracked the progress of the various projects in a software where John divided them in various steps. John set up these steps very broadly. For example, analysis, initial setup, development, release, maintenance, to avoid creating too many of them. We then needed to input the time we spent on each of these steps. If the project was missing some steps or hit the budget cap, we couldn't input our timesheets and technically weren't allowed to start working. Per company policy, our duty was to inform our direct superior about these issues, in this case, Mark. He then should have informed John, who would finally have to increase the cap. As the good manager that he was, John knew all these steps were a huge waste of Mark's and our time, so he allowed us to temporarily sign our timesheets locally and start or continue our work, gather himself all of our cap increase requests together, do all of them simultaneously, and then directly let us know we could input our timesheets in the software. Then the company got acquired by a hedge fund. Suddenly a lot of new middle managers appeared and John was moved to a higher position in a different department. To replace him, they hired Phil. Phil tried to present himself as the open to everyone's requests manager, but it became obvious pretty quickly that he was more a I'll stick to company policies as harder as I can guy, probably to appeal to his ego or to some higher up. First thing he did was to completely change the project's organization to better check the project advancement. Now in a project, Every task, every little change had its own step and budget cap. Remember that if the step was not in the software, we weren't allowed to start working on it. He then enforced our daily timesheets input. It became mandatory to input them at maximum the next day so we could be more responsible about marking the project progress. It could have been okay if it wasn't for the fact that projects budgets were drastically reduced Basically, after reaching the middle of our developments, we already reached those caps and could not insert any more timesheets. When we started asking Phil about creating those steps or raising the budget caps, like we did with John, he quickly redirected us to Mark, as that was company policy and the proper chain of command. Mark's job quickly became heck as he basically had to spend half the day asking Phil to create project steps or raise caps. We knew we were bothering Mark, and he knew we couldn't do anything else. He tried to talk to Phil about easing these policies, but without success. At the end of the month, everyone was behind with the timesheets input, and some tasks were not started at all. Phil gathered us and the other teams and started his rant about how it was our fault since we required too much time to do our job and it was not acceptable. As our team leader, Mark was particularly targeted and probably missed some bonuses that he had no problem getting when John was the manager. His fault? Not letting Phil know soon enough that steps weren't available or budget caps were reached. It was enough for him. It was time to maliciously comply to company policies. He asked Phil to let us stay some minutes after the meeting to explain us how to resolve these issues. He agreed but wanted to stay in the meeting too. Mark calmly said to us, 
it is imperative that you tell me and only me that steps are missing or caps have been reached as soon as you notice. You must send me an email with this precise subject. I'll then inform Phil only mail requests will be accepted. He remarked various times that the mail needed to have a specific subject format, like Project X, Step Y, Missing, or Project X, Step Y, Cap Reached. And every time he was looking at us with a look that was saying, just do like I say, trust me, we started doing exactly what he told us and soon discovered why he was so confident. A few days passed and an angry Phil stormed in our room yelling at Mark that, his behavior was unacceptable and an urgent meeting with the higher-ups was scheduled in a few minutes. Mark went, and after about half an hour, returned with a satisfied smile on his face, and after him, a defeated Phil. He later told us that he basically set up a forwarding rule in his mailbox, which forwarded to Phil every single mail whose subjects match the patterns above with a predefined text like, Dear Phil, I'd like to inform you that the team brought to my attention the fact that Project X is missing Step Y or similar. In those few days, he submerged Phil's mailbox with our requests. Phil probably hoped that the outcome of the meeting would have went in his favor, but the higher up stated that no company policy was violated. Mark wasn't spamming, as those were all legitimate work-related emails. And was Phil's duty to appropriately manage the situation? Also, Mark now had proof that he was immediately notifying Phil about the project issues, so nothing could be his or our fault anymore. I stopped working for the company shortly after, but after a few months they told me that Phil was demoted and moved to another position with lesser responsibilities. I love that he created so much more overhead that ultimately loops right back around to himself and then just kept complaining that everybody else wasn't solving all of these extra problems he introduced. Dude absolutely deserved the demotion. Our next story is Brad and the Table. This story was told to me by my friend Lucy. At the time, she lived in an army town and worked for many summers at a restaurant popular with the officers and their families. At this particular restaurant, which is on the higher end, there's a table reserved for high-ranking officers who visit the base. People who work there refer to it as the Table. On busier nights, when there isn't a higher-ranking officer in town, it's utilized to seat more patrons, but for the most part, it's left alone. It's Friday, so it's busy. There's a general visiting the base, so the table isn't being used, just in case he decided to grace the establishment with his presence. Lucy is manning her section when the owner, named John for the purposes of this story, waves her down. She heads over and he tells her, I need you and Annie, another server, to help me man the table. The general's coming? She asked. He said, nope, Brad is. Lucy rolled her eyes. Brad was a local bigwigs high school aged son, and he had it in his mind that he was a hot shot. He frequented the restaurant with his girl of the week and proceeded to make a nuisance of himself every time, but not enough to the point that he was asked to leave. Lucy asked John, are you sure? What if the general wants to eat dinner with us? At this, John leaned in with a wide smile and said, Apparently, the general called and told us to give Brad the table and to give him and his guests anything he wanted. Lucy then smiled as she realized what was about to happen. Brad was about to get a serving of malicious compliance on the house. Twenty minutes later, Brad, wearing a West Point blazer, arrives with several young people. John makes a big show of greeting them and escorting them to the table. The people look around, impressed, and Brad proceeds to command Lucy, John, and Annie around like he owns the restaurant. The only good thing about this particular experience was that, due to him being underaged, Brad and his buddies never tried to order any alcohol. Brad proceeded to be a nuisance, demanding more appetizers, sending food back because it wasn't cooked just right, ordering the most expensive entrees on the menu, yada yada yada. Lucy, Annie, and John continue with this, smiling as more and more food is added to the table. It's time for the check. Lucy told me that the entire group managed to rack up $843.29, not counting the mandatory gratuity because the party is above a certain size. Brad gets the bill, and he flips out. What is this? He barked, waving the check. It's your check, John said. The general said to let you order anything you wanted. Brad stands up to argue, and that's when the host rushes up, her face white. John, 
The general is here, she whispered. Everyone turns to look, and there's the general with his entourage. John excuses himself before going over. He and the general start to talk for a few minutes, and Lucy notices Brad turning white and starting to get out of his seat. Annie looked at him and said, You better not try and dine and dash, she said. I really don't want to have to sick these nice officers on you. Brad sat down and fidgeted. John and the general come back to the table. Making eye contact with Brad, John said, Brad, you said the good general here insisted you have the table and you can order anything you want. Is this true? He only nodded. Well, the general here said that he never made no such phone call. That's odd, Brad said before looking at the general. I'm pretty sure it was you I talked to. Uh, sir, I have the phone number. Let's call it, John said, pulling out his cell phone and dialing a number. That's when they hear Brad's brand new cell phone going off in his pocket. The general held his hand out and Brad puts the phone in his hand. He checks the number and asks John, Is your number 123-456-7890? It is, John said. The general then proceeded to get a serious look on his face. Brad, are you a cadet? I'm being considered for an appointment, Brad said. The general nodded. I suggest you pay your bill, tip in full and apologize to the staff for your behavior. I also suggest withdrawing your name as soon as possible to save yourself the embarrassment. Keeping his head down, Brad paid the bill, meekly apologized, and left with his sycophants. The general and his entourage patiently waited for the table to be cleared and set. They proceeded to have a nice meal, leaving a generous tip and apologizing for people like Brad. Lucy proceeded to have a wonderful Brad-free career. The nicest thing about this is not only do you get that huge gratuity from this obscene order, but Brad is never going to show his face up in that place ever again. At least not if he's sure that there's a chance anybody working there would ever recognize him. And in a place that has the table so well recognized, it's almost a certainty. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another awesome malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.